Hi everyone, this is GKCS. Today's topic is a very important one. It comes up often in distributed systems and it's called consistency. So consistency is usually related to data. That's what we'll be looking at today. And you'll hear this topic come up often, whether it's the CAP theorem, where C stands for consistency, or you might have heard it in transactions, database transactions. C again here stands for consistency. So what is consistency? Well, if you have multiple copies of data, those two data pieces should match each other. The content should be the same. That's the general idea. Let's take a simple example. Initially, let's take Facebook in their initial days. So we are in the Harvard campus right now and we have a single server and we have a single copy of data which different students from all over campus connect to. Now, the idea is that if a user creates a profile, then the database system that we have, whether it's a database or a file system, doesn't matter, but it's a single copy of data. So this profile will be created in this space. And if another user wants to actually see this profile, so there's user A and user B, B wants to see A's profile. Profile A has been created over here. When B says, get me profile A, all you need to do in the server is to check your database, check for profile A and return that as a response. So this is perfect. It's giving you the right information. What's the problem? The problem is that you have a single server, which means that this is a single point of failure. What if there's a network outage? What if a tsunami hits this server? Uh, you're going to lose all the data. And even if that doesn't happen, even if you have something like a power loss, then your system is down. So that's a problem. And that's called a single point of failure. You just need one strike to take out your entire system. Facebook is out. But these are the initial days, so maybe it's fine. Um, what, what else are the problems? The second problem is that you might have a lot of users coming here. So you might need to scale the server. But up to what point do you scale the server? Uh, I mean, how many boxes do you buy? For a single box, if you increase the capacity of the server, up to what point do you go? I mean, soon enough, you'll hit the supercomputer range. So that's going to cost you a lot. It's not like you can get supercomputers at the supermarket. So the cost of vertical scaling is going to be high. And after a certain point in time, it's actually going to hit a limit. You cannot handle that many users in a single computer. The third one is that you might have multiple users from various parts of the world connecting to this database. So today it was open for Harvard. Tomorrow it's open for Oxford. So that's on the other, other continent. And for them to actually connect this, to this database takes a lot of time. So the latency here is really high. That's let's say about 100 milliseconds. You want to cut this down. You want to bring it down to 10 milliseconds. It's impossible because the amount of time it will take to hop from the Oxford server through the routers and finally hit this Harvard server is going to be something. There's something like latency. This is high latency. Okay, so how do we mitigate these problems? With a single server, we cannot because we, are, we have seen that there's a vertical scaling limit. So we'll probably need to add more servers. And that's, I think, exactly what Facebook did. Let's have two servers, one in Harvard and one in Oxford. So this is the Harvard server and this is the Oxford server. Okay. And there's no communication between them. That's, that's exactly what Facebook did. They didn't have any communication between these servers. They just had data copies relevant to the students here. So all the Harvard students would connect here and all the Oxford students would connect here and then they would be able to see each other's data, but only limited to the campus that they belong to. Of course, there's a problem here. There's no data sharing. So what makes Facebook Facebook is that you're able to share data and that's not happening right now. There's no way to share that data. Uh, why would you choose this? Well, you might choose product wise that people don't care about sharing their data. Maybe uh, this is all about events in that particular campus. So there's no way a Harvard person is going to go uh, that distance, but eventually this is not going to be good enough. You will need to share data and that's where the problem comes in. Let's say we try to avoid this problem as much as possible. We say that if you need any kind of Oxford data as a Harvard student, 
you connect to this server cross continental that's okay but you connect to it we are not going to keep any data belonging to oxford in any other region that's one way to start but the older problems are still alive for example if the oxford server goes down then it's still a single point of failure uh, the other thing is that latency if a harvard student needs to connect to an oxford server it needs to go all the way from the us to uk which is going to take time so latency is still bad the single point of failure is still real uh, what else cost of vertical scaling well yeah you can argue that uh, the the number of oxford students can become huge but uh, that's not that's not really a concern anymore so we have kind of solved this use case by spreading our data according to where it belongs but we still have problems of latency and single point of failure so what can we do well to reduce latency we can kind of cache some of the information some of the oxford information right here in the harvard server so maybe there are some popular profiles that you want to see on facebook from oxford well you have it cached here in harvard so you fetch it once and then you cache it here and then you keep giving a response back so the way it's going to happen is instead of connecting directly to the oxford server you actually talk to the harvard server the harvard server sees that does this profile exist in my cache the one that you're calling for get it um, assume that this profile does not exist uh, and it is it is found in the oxford server so you mention that in the request get a from oxford okay and then it actually sends a request to this server which gives back a response with the profile this profile is then stored in the cache returned to the user and now if any other user comes here then you have that profile right here so that will reduce latency but it will not get rid of latency there's still the chance that you are going to have a cache miss and you might have cache replacement after which there is a cache miss so these are problems how do we solve them well there's only one practical way to solve this kind of stuff and that's to get rid of the the shyness that we have with sharing data so if you're going to have multiple copies of data it's going to solve a lot of your problems firstly the single point of failure that we were talking about if you have multiple places where students data is being stored let's say uh, student data a b and c is being stored here and you have the exact same copy here a b and c okay and let's say this is being stored in europe and this is being stored in the us no more single point of failure if this server this data which is being stored in this server crashes that's okay you can always connect to this one so that takes care of single point of failure also what about network issues well they are solved now because if you need to connect to a user c and c actually belongs to oxford they belong to europe that's okay because you have the data here also you have a copy of the data if you need to make changes if you need to make an update to c you just mention that c gets updated over here maybe c++ uh, and then over here eventually there needs to be some mechanism by which you can send this update which makes this also c++ in europe so the latency problems are also fixed because you have quick responses the moment you say update c uh, once this is updated you actually send back that response and users are happy the latency is low so we have solved the problem and uh, everything is good isn't it except for one thing that's the this big monster over here called consistency consistency says that if you have multiple copies of data they should be the same so these two copies of data should be the same c++ should be c++ that's fine it seems like we can do that but how do we do that so when you make an update over here how do you propagate that update to this point let's start simple you can do this manually i know you might feel like it's a waste of time to even mention it but the reality is that if you have very infrequent updates uh, in a product you can make that decision that hey we can keep it as c++ here and c here you know maybe the europeans don't need to see this change for a while so this often happens in bank accounts you actually make a change to the ledger you just note it down and eventually you make that system consistent by spreading information all around the world so it's a bunch of pluses and minuses for every account eventually you're going to be showing that in the bank statement so they even mention that it's going to take us a few days 
for it to reflect in your bank statement in the worst case. But of course, uh, in a in a real time response system, you can't afford that. If you have something like Facebook, you can't afford that. So we want to propagate this change quickly. We want to make this a C++. How do we do that? We can use some sort of electronic message uh, network protocol like TCP seems like a good idea. Uh, why do I say TCP? Because TCP is reliable delivery. Uh, you also have ordered delivery. There's a lot of good stuff that comes with TCP. So let's try to understand how does this protocol work in this case. When you send an update from C to C++, you are effectively saying change C to C++. Okay, that's the update that you're propagating from USA to Europe. When Europe gets this message, C to C++, internally in the database, they have C, which they change to C++, and that's it. That's all you need to do, right? You had a message transmission and you're good. However, what happens if the message transmission fails? If there's a network issue, or maybe the Europe server is down, what do you do then? Well, you will never get to know unless you get an acknowledgement, right? So the European server should send back an acknowledgement. That's again, quite simple. Uh, if you get an acknowledgement, you know that the update has gone through and you're sorted. All right, what happens if you don't get the acknowledgement? What happens if the acknowledgement fails or the server is down? Well, you can retry. You can keep trying as the first server, the US server, to make this update till it succeeds. How many times do you retry? You can make it infinite, which means that every five seconds you're going to be retrying. Hey, make C, C++, hey, make C, C++. <laughs> or you can, uh, you know, just try five times and then eventually you can give up. Uh, and you can also mark this record as maybe a, maybe a wrong record. Or maybe you can afford these two data points to be inconsistent. This actually brings us to a fundamental problem with distributed systems, which depend on acknowledgements for consistency. The idea is that if you send an update to one of these servers, then it has two options. Either it locally commits the update, either it makes that change, or it waits for its peer to give an acknowledgement back. If it makes the change locally, then it's already committed. And it cannot depend on the peer to actually make the commit to because this message might fail. It's an unreliable network. And you'll be surprised by the number of times this failure happens. It seems like electronic systems should not have these many failures, but there are hardware failures, there are failures in software, there's lots of stuff that happens. So let's, let's assume this is an unreliable network and B may not be able to make the commit. If you wait on B to make the commit, this is basically giving responsibility to B. They have the same problem. When you ask them to update something, you are effectively a client for B. And if B makes the commit, then B has no idea whether their acknowledgement is ever going to reach you. You can try to do something fancy, like sending the acknowledgement of this acknowledgement, but that's an infinite process. If, you know, if B has already made the commit, then they're in trouble. If B is waiting for this special acknowledgement, which is ACK of ACK, right, of this, an acknowledgement of this, then when it makes a commit, it has no idea whether this is ever going to reach. The problem is called the two generals problem. You can look it up on the internet. <laughs> you, can, you can study about this, the two generals problem, but that's the basic idea. You can never be sure if you're making a commit, which is based on the hope that the acknowledgement actually goes through. So, we can't have this in our distributed system if we are hoping for consistency. What can we do? We can give them a special role, a leader role. So let's make A, the US server, a leader. And it's the only person who can commit. It's the only person who can actually do writes on a database, which simplifies the system a bit. If you send an update, you cannot send it to B. You can send it only to A. So firstly, that update comes here. And A says, all right, change the data here. Make the commit. Good. What about B? Well, B gets regular updates from A because it's the only place where you can write information. And B is a place where you can read information from. So this is a follower. And the follower has the change in the data, assuming that this goes through. And things should be fine. Now, two read operations are going to give you the same data. But of course, it could be that this data doesn't go through. In which case, what do you do? If you read the data without the change, 
you have inconsistency. So this becomes an inconsistent system again. You are having dirty reads. If you wait for the update to come through before you give a response, at that time the system is actually not available. If you hit the system, you're not getting a response. It's as good as the system is dead. It's waiting, yes, but it doesn't matter. I mean, for you, you're not getting a response to this. So that's one fundamental uh, problem with a distributed system. If you have pure consistency, then your system is not available. And if you have some sort of availability, then your system will have to suffer through inconsistencies. Okay, that's the reason why consistency is such a big deal. People talk about, hey, can we have a totally consistent system or how much consistency are you looking for? But this is the general idea. Uh, I'll just expand on this a little more with one final example, which is called the two phase commit protocol. It's rather similar to just two systems and the, and the thing that we saw with acknowledgements. But the idea is that you have a leader now and you have multiple followers, like lots of followers, right? You might have B, C, D, E, many. You might imagine these followers to also be services. You can have a profile service, which is asking the session service and the document service to wait. Okay, but we don't care. These can be generic systems. You can also have, by the way, uh, this is a server and this could be Kafka, a message queue. So if you want to ensure that a message or an event is pushed into multiple systems, definitely, then you can go for something as strict as a two-phase commit. Let's see what that is, 2PC. Okay, the general idea here is that as a leader, when you get an update, you send a prepare request to your followers. Your followers give you an acknowledgement that, hey, yes, I got the prepare request. And when you get these acknowledgements, you ask your followers to commit. So this is effectively committing a transaction, right? That's a consistency bit here. Uh, once you ask them to commit, I'm assuming that life is really nice and they give you acknowledgements. And the system works perfectly. So what happened here is a transaction happened, maybe some sort of an operation. This might be a complex update, multiple statements. Uh, the leader asks its followers to do that in the prepare and then finally commit that operation, which is effectively hitting control S, which is saving in the database. That's when the data will start reflecting and things should be fine. However, there's a lot of edge cases in this. Let's see. Firstly, if you send a prepare statement, what actually happens? Well, you have a bunch of statements in this update. So in the database, what's going to happen is you're going to begin a transaction and then you're going to write down these statements, statement one, two, up to N, the number of statements required to complete this update. But there's one thing missing and that is the commit. When you commit, you actually tell the database to reflect these changes to everyone who's trying to get this data. Okay, two phase commit, the first phase, is prepare and prepare is basically do all this stuff but wait for my final go through okay so that's a prepare when you send an acknowledgement you basically say that I have done this stuff and I'm ready to commit the last statement is remaining if a leader does not get all the acknowledgements back it assumes that some of the some of the systems which it was sending a prepare request to has failed there might be a timeout or there might be just you might give a negative response also, whatever be the case, the leader fails the transaction. So over here you get a rollback. As a follower, you can keep a time limit, which is let's say five minutes or six minutes. You know that within five or six minutes, the leader's message should have reached. If it doesn't, you just do a rollback and your system is consistent. Why is it consistent? Well, if you have some sort of an update, let's say again, C changing to C++, uh, the leader first is holding this information. It's logged this row. When you did a begin transaction, you first logged that row C and then you made it C++ and it's still locked, right? Um, after some period of time, you saw that this transaction is not going to happen. There's no way it's going to happen. So roll it back, convert C++ to C again. And now if someone does a get, that's okay. They're going to be able to CC. 
the same thing here. I mean, after the rollback has happened, once the leader has rolled back, uh, you will be getting a get with C. On the other hand, if things go well, then the leader will be sending a commit message to everyone. And once you receive this commit, as a follower, you just commit this transaction. This transaction is complete. Things are fine. From your side, the data is reflecting. It's no longer C. It is C++ now here. And let's assume that this also went through properly, C++. If someone does a get operation now, they're going to get C++, which is exactly what you wanted. Even before that, when the leader sends a commit message, before that, it actually commits to the database. Okay, its own database because it's the leader. So this is C++. If someone does a get operation now, it becomes C++ here. Once the commit operation reaches here, they get C++ in the commit operations. I mean, in the get operations. Let's assume that one of these commits actually failed. The, one of the commit messages that you sent failed. What happens then? Well, after a certain period of time, this system is going to assume that the transaction has failed and it's going to roll things back. So there's a problem. If you, if you do that, then it's going to be C and this is going to be C++. And if someone does a get operation now, then we are in trouble. Okay, get will give us C. So we can't allow this. Where is the problem? The problem is the rollback. Usually in transactions, you are easily able to roll back, right? Uh, in these places, you can't. You cannot roll back by yourself based on time. You have to wait for the master, or in this case, the leader, to actually send messages of rollback. In case someone sends a negative response or there is a timeout, the leader actually tells them to roll back the transaction. This statement of rollback is not going to be done by followers themselves. They are effectively brain dead. They don't have a brain rather, they're not brain dead. Uh, but the leader actually tells them to roll back if an acknowledgement has failed to reach. Okay. That is, that is fine. So if, if you send an acknowledgement, things go well. After that, if your commit fails, what happens? Think back on TCP, you do a retry. You keep retrying commits. So it might be that the follower actually gets the commit message, but is not able to send you an acknowledgement because of which you are doing retries. That's okay. You have a transaction ID uh, and once you do a commit, for the same transaction ID, if you get another commit message, that's okay. You're just going to say, okay, fine, acknowledged. As long as the acknowledgements keep failing, the leader keeps retrying and uh, the commit messages keep going through. Once the commit message is actually acknowledged, the leader is sorted. It knows that the data that it's showing is consistent with the data that you are showing. Okay, uh, is there any problem here? Well, if you make a commit of C++ here, and your commit message doesn't go through, then you're going to get inconsistent data. Okay, so what you need to do is either block all read operations here, you take locks here, and all read operations here are blocked, um, and you take a lock here also. Read operations and write operations on this row, the C row, is blocked. So if anyone does a get request, they get nothing. They're waiting. This is a problem, of course, uh, the problem is that your system is not available. It is consistent. Now your system is totally consistent. When people are able to see C here, they're also able to see the same data here. Uh, when there's a change, they're also able to see that change being reflected to all of your followers because you wait for the acknowledgement till the end and you keep retrying with no side effects because you have something called, you know, the transaction ID makes this an ID important system. You can have a look at this in one of the other videos that I've made. But uh, the idea is like, this is a good idea if you need absolute consistency. If you have a financial system, this is a good idea, total consistency. But the cost is that your system is down. Any get request is failing because this lo is locked. Okay, so the general idea of all of this is to see what happens when you have a perfectly consistent distributed system. The costs are usually high, not just for availability, which is one factor. There's also performance, which is a factor. Uh, in certain cases, the cost of this system, like the physical cost, 
of the system increases. So you may not want to do that all the time. Instead, you might go for something which is a lot more sensible called eventual consistency. This is an extremely important concept in distributed systems. It comes very closely tied with isolation guarantees, you know, engineering guarantees for reading and writing data. Uh, I have spoken about this at length at the interview ready course, but the next video will be on eventual consistency. So if you want a notification for that, make sure you hit the subscribe button. If you have any doubts or suggestions on this, you can leave them in the comments below. I'll see you next time.